Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Vesaliki Annis, I'm Business Director of the Center for Cancer Direct Development and also Senior Director of the Mesh Academy. We are very excited to be hosting the inaugural um, virtual seminar series for CCDD. Um, if you are unfamiliar with us, um, we, our mission is to accelerate promising oncology therapeutics into the clinic through collaborative drug development. Um, we have kicked it off um, with some internal information in September, and we were very excited for this series um, featuring our external advisory committee uh, members, our experts that are, are critical to the CCDD and into in, engaging with all of you on your projects. So this is what you'll see in the lineup um, today and coming up in future seminars. There's more information, I just highlight that here, and we can follow up with you with more um, registration links and um, future seminars in the spring as well. But for those unfamiliar with CCDD in our scope, I'll just briefly touch on this. All this information is on the website and you can directly contact me or the MESH team for more information. But the CCDD scope is very broad, um, looking at all modalities um, and supporting projects um, that, are, that get advanced through various stages of development from target validation up to preclinical stages. Um, the only thing that is more restrictive in scope is the fact that this is an oncology centered um, drug development center. So this will be projects focused on oncology and USC Norris um, catchment um, area priorities. Um, and of course there are specific specifications around eligibility, which, which most often um, people here um, fall into as Norris members or project leads where USC faculty um, may have the obligation to assign IP to USC. Um, I say that um, in somewhat quotes as we are a center that looks at new ways and new pathways to move a project forward. So um, don't look at this as any eliminations. Please contact us if you have an interesting project and you would like um, to think, see whether you're a good fit for CCDD. And if not um, CCDD, that's the job of MESH is to find a new path forward for you. So please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, the cycle for submission is open. Um, again, information on the CCDD website shown here or directly contact um, Melissa Rogers. Let me get that here. Another entrant participant here. And you can see the way that the projects are submitted and um, the type of questions to get that process started. And we will also have another pre recorded um, seminar specifically about the CCDD and the process and more details for you to have as a reference in the coming weeks. Okay, what I'm very excited um, to talk to you about today and to share with you is the CCD partnering approach that has um, a, the first partner for CCDD. And the reason we have a partnering approach is everyone involved in drug discovery and development understands is this is a very you know, high risk attrition based type of endeavor and it requires, you know, it's a team sport. It requires multiple types of um, collaborators and, and people interacting to support a project to get it to um, the clinic and, and then hopefully to the patient. Um, one of the critical gaps um, that we had um, that identified here at USC that is perfectly matched with the capabilities at Sanford Burnham Previs. And we are thrilled to have this um, partnership formalized and have it as a resource here for all of you at USC. So um, Dr. Michael Jackson is here with us today and he is going to talk to us more about um, the capabilities and, and some specific nuances too around identifying chemical leads um, um, for drug targeting and high throughput sequencing. Um, sequencing screening. And, but first I wanna give you a little bit of background. Um, Dr. Jackson has held various leadership roles, including president of research and development at Alza Corporation, senior VP of drug discovery at J&J, &J, and VP of drug discovery and senior director at R.W. Johnson Pharmaceutical um, Research and Development. But most recently he is the senior vice president of drug discovery and development at Sanford Burnham Previs. He oversees a bi-coastal operation of the Previs Center and um, then includes approximately 80 people, if that may have changed, Michael, you'll tell us, of um, Person Institute that's embedded, um, a drug discovery enterprise that's embedded in the Institute. And the center is equipped with just the state of the art, ultra high throughput screening um, capabilities and lead discovery capabilities, which you're gonna learn more about today. So it's my honor to have you here, um, Dr. Jackson, and welcome. Oh, and before we, we I stop my screen, everyone, this is a very interactive um, 
uh, virtual seminar, please don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat and we will call on you at the end of the seminar. And I also highly encourage you to put your videos on and we'd like to see your faces and engage with you at the end. <laughs> I see you, Scott, smiling. So uh, we're, we're ready to kick off. Thank you, Michael. I know you want me to turn my face off, but I'll leave it on. Leave it on. We'd like to see you, Scott. And we'll transition to Dr. Jackson's slides and we're ready to go. Okay, do we see some slides or is it still thinking about it? We see your slides. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, yeah, so what I'm gonna cover today is um, elements of assay development and screening towards finding a chemical, uh, a hit that is uh, on the ways to a drug. Uh, I'm not so much gonna focus on the later stage, which is development of those hits beyond through medicinal chemistry and uh, towards leads and towards drugs. What I would say is that many of the things uh, I'm gonna tell you today have been based on uh, working side by side at this institute in San Diego, uh, Sanford, Burnham, Prebis. Um, you, you may or may not have heard of it. It's more known as the Burnham Institute, but then we were fortunate to uh, have uh, some philanthropic donations. So we are now the Sanford Burnham Previs Medical Discovery Institute. Um, and this institute is a non-for-profit institute, uh, really focused on basic uh, bio biology and uncovering the basis of disease. Uh, and in addition to having a, uh, a cadre of faculty, uh, uh, who uh, particularly an NCI designated uh, basic research cancer center, uh, which many of the faculty, at least 30 of them belong to that. You can see various other uh, centers uh, of, uh, of, of, of interest here. In addition to these scientific centers, we also have the Prebis Center, which is what I direct, which is the drug discovery center. And in particular, it is this center that really is partnering with USC and with you guys to try and help advanced projects towards uh, in a translational direction. Now, uh, you can see this center is composed of multiple components. Uh, all of the elements you really need to be able to go from the concept of a, uh, here's my target, this is what I'd like to uh, target with my therapeutic, all the way through to uh, fairly advanced pro uh, leads and drug candidates at the far end. I won't read through all of the components, but it is very much a team effort. And uh, in fact, unlike some elements of uh, basic biology, the, the full thought from the beginning to the end is valuable to conduct that thought exercise of, even if I do come up with this drug, how am I gonna test it in animals? How am I gonna test it in patients, et cetera? And I understand that you had a, a talk previously about target identification and validation, perhaps one of the most important elements that one can uh, consume one's time with initially to try and make sure that you are working on the, the you know, uh, a target that really is fully validated. And I will give you a, a couple of, uh, well, like certainly one example in, in this talk of where it didn't go all perfectly. So um, this happens. Well, we, you know, in, in trying to put this talk together, I wanted to sort of say a little bit how I see, see the, uh, the overall uh, process here. In general, how we operate, because we're a center of specialized experts in this early drug discovery aspects. And although, as I say, it's gonna be mainly focused on small molecules, much of the concepts behind this will apply to really around asset development and at the, the industrialization, the miniaturization of assays for identifying a therapeutic. So obviously many of those elements would also apply to if you were interested in developing an antibody and testing it, peptides, RNA, all sorts of, it still comes down to an assay or how are you gonna test it in parallel and try and find the best of, of the bunch. Now, in thinking of the roles and responsibilities here, the center's roles and responsibilities very much to try and at the end partner with you to come up with the best possible compound in the world that actually is gonna target uh, and hit whatever it is you consider a bit of biology you want to modulate, trying to come up with the best possible molecule. On the other hand, your lab, you, your research scientists that work with you primarily should be really obsessed with, is this the right target? Is it the right path? What's the therapeutic hypothesis? How are we gonna test this? And how are we gonna develop those really bespoke assays and animal models downstream to be able to test this? So you end up sort of with a, a, a double sort of track of activities. The top one being really um, the one that the Previs Center, you can partner with us or others to, to, to work on that sort of thing. And um, 
And then a second tier, uh, which is going primarily at the beginning with target identification and validation, and then developing all the therapeutic hypotheses, the biomarkers, the models, the cellular models, and then all the way through to the clinical thinking. So I'm not going through all the, re the words down here, but there's lots of components of all of this. It's a great big process. Uh, it's typically be, you know, going to be to conduct the activities shown on this timeline. It's, it's a three to five year activity, at least in general. It is not something you're going to, in general, figure out and complete in a year. Uh, that's the case in pharmaceutical companies, as well as uh, within academia. So let's go move on to sort of how, what most people are going to be focusing on. And a lot of our activities, when we partner with people, are focused around grant uh, applications like this, this PAR 2271, that is specifically designed to fund work to conduct acid development and screening to discover chemical probes and drugs uh, to, uh, to move forward. So this type of thing is very prescriptive what it is. And we, have, we, we are currently have about 40 NIH grants, not all on screening, about half of them on towards screening and the other half on hit to lead and lead optimization funded mainly by the NIH. So we get up, we pretty much got an idea of where we're trying to get to in many of the interactions we have. Now here's a, oh, it's quite a, a collection of mugshots, but anyway, here are some of the people who uh, work very much with me, experts in medicinal chemistry, in screening, uh, assay development of high content microscopy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these guys really know what they're doing. They work on many different projects and have partnered with many people. So the first thing I would recommend is you know, to talk to people, right? Of how to do this. Don't run along and believe you know how best to do it. Talk to people and get their experience. I'm going to tell you some of my experiences and perhaps prejudices um, as, that's, uh, of uh, what to do and how not to do it. What I would say, it is based on a fair amount of data, uh, which is that on average, this center here conducts around 20 high throughput screens a year uh, and is con typically synthesizing one to 2,000 compounds per year in in, in uh, um, first, you know, uh, de novo compounds that are um, new chemical entities every year. So we have a lot of uh, activities going on, a lot of projects we've been through. So we also have obviously a great deal of uh, help in terms of automation, uh, state of the art automation of robotics. Most of the work we're doing is using 1536 well, high density plates and using Acoustic dispensing, that sound wave dispensing to move liquid around. This is, I'm not going to show you all of that, but once you start considering all this, you start to really get the expertise of how to get your biology into a high density format. And there, there are tricks to all of this, and there are ways that are better at doing things than others from our perspective. Uh, we also have lots of help in terms of uh, liquid handling, uh, ways that uh, allow us to do wash depths and various other elements all the way through to more sophisticated assays that are live cell imaging. I won't, again, read through all the components on this slide, but if any of you are interested in all of the equipment that it actually is available at this center, it's all online uh, on, on, under the, if you go to the website of the center. Um, so you're then going to say, well, okay, yeah, I know you've got all this equipment. What about chemical libraries? We have a very extensive chemical collections. We keep adding to this at a rate of around 50 to 100,000 new chemicals per year. Uh, we have on the one side, the diversity collections, nearly a million compounds with all sorts of shapes and, and structures. And then on the show not here is also another collection or set of collections actually, or which we call bioactive collections. This would include all of the known FDA approved drugs. For example, we've got about 85% of them actually uh, you know, kinase inhibitors, epigenetic inhibitors, all sorts of things that one are highly characterized and have activity in assays. So those are the sorts of, we have plenty of substrate there. So this um, session here was really, um, or this talk today was really all about finding those hits. Uh, how, how if I've got a drug target, what assay should I use? What library should I use? Uh, and it's all about the screen, isn't it? All right, so I, I would think that, and here, here is a kind of a flow diagram, and it says enter here, so you're going to enter here, that's the clue. Um, so uh, 
So in general, people would come to us with an assay that would work. That's, that, that sounds trivial, but it doesn't always work, by the way. Um, and uh, in, ideally, that would be working, such an assay would be working in a 96-well format. Now, when I say that, to be honest with you, ideally, you would not have developed the assay yet. I would much prefer you would speak to us to, to tell us about what a fantastic target you've identified. You've just found it, and you've got to publish it, and you'd really like to start a drug discovery campaign on it, and we can start brainstorming with you what is the best way to screen that piece of biology, that target, that, um, the, the specifics. And then we would talk about what, how you would go and try and develop an initial proof of concept assay on that. And if it's in an Eppendorf tube, that's fine. We'll help you get that to a, to a higher density format. And then we are then gonna try and get that assay, transfer it to, to us and try and get that to work in a much higher density format. And I say, well, why are you obsessed with such high density? Well, if you wanna screen hundreds of thousands of diverse compounds, the only way to get the cost down and also the volumes and the amounts of compound used down is to be doing these assays in pretty high density formats so that we're using the, the, you know, one microliter of liquid, two microliters of liquid in the assay as opposed to 10, 20, 30. The, everything scales in cost in reagents, et cetera. And then once we've tried to take that, we would typically be doing a pilot screen. So we'll do a smaller screen, see how well this assay performs. If it performs reasonably well, then we're going to uh, start saying, well, let's start thinking about applying for a grant based on this data. And isn't that how it all works? Well, kind of yes and kind of no. We are much more obsessed with this slide, right? The primary screen is just the very beginning, right? And it's important, and you'll see an example I'll come up with in a moment, of we may have had five or six different assays we could have used in the primary screen, but we can only choose really one in general because of the cost. You can't do everything in parallel, three or four different screening formats times 300,000 compounds. It's just too expensive. Now, sometimes we might do two if we were fortunate and we can find the, the monies to do it, but in general, you're gonna have a primary screen, which is the one that you're gonna pick. And hence the title of this talk, which is kind of balancing throughput with physiological relevance. So obviously you could screen a really, really complicated cell-based screen that maybe was derived from IPS derived cultures that were differentiated for 20 days and do something exotic. And I'm gonna say, well, that sounds good, um, but doesn't sound very suitable for doing a large screen. It would be much better further down this testing funnel where we really want to, so what, what assay have you got that you know, we really could get a reasonable throughput to and he's really very uh, good at discriminating finding hits. And it turns out it's not so, it's quite as obvious as, as it might at first seem. And um, we in the center have learned a great deal over the 15 years that the center has existed of which of these assays seem really good um, at finding hits in the noise of a screen and which ones are not. So I'm gonna share a little bit with that you today uh, to give you some, some, uh, some thoughts on that. But really at the end of the day, um, when you do a high throughput screen, you maybe will get, uh, let's say a two or 300,000 compound screen you'll get one or 2,000 compounds typically that will register in that screen. So you've got to have a, something else that's gonna help you downstream of that. You can't move on with one or 2,000 compounds. So you're gonna have counter screens, cross screens, various other things that convince you that this compound is real. And obviously things like dose response curves really matter. Uh, and then eventually we're gonna get down to a collection of one or 200 where we can then get order dry powders of those and really reconfirm that the chemical is the chemical that we screened. And then we're gonna move on from beyond. So that's the overall game plan. Uh, we have a tremendous breadth of assay platforms. Uh, again, I don't have time to go through all of the assay platforms. So what I'm gonna do is to pick and choose a few, which are my favorites, right? Cause I'm, I'm in charge, that's okay, right? So I mean, that's all right. So. Um, these are the ones that I think we have found over the years um, uh, are, as I say, particularly good at finding compounds in the face of the noise. 
And I, my last slide will come back and address a bit more of that. So one of my favorite, uh, so let's, I'm gonna break this into sort of three parts, the, uh, the, the remainder of this talk. Some assets, some portion focused more around biochemical, biophysical assays. So this is an example where you know exactly what your target is, right? It's not a pathway, it's not a process. You know what it is. It's this kinase, this GPCR, hopefully not this protein-protein interaction, but any, anyway, let's, let's stick with a specific protein. And in some cases, you know that protein has an, enzyme, an activity. So the question is, can you measure that activity? If it's an enzymatic assay, we probably can devise a assay to measure that enzymatic activity, or you can, right? This is kind of, a, so that's a good go-to place. Uh, we like enzymatic assays, particularly ones that uh, actually have true enzymatic activity rather than a barely enzymatically active, things that truly are active. Protein thermal shift assay. This is a really interesting assay, and I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. This is where you uh, can purify the protein, and uh, in, and you know it, and it folds up correctly. Let's say it also has enzymatic activity, and let's say it could even be crystallized, right? So this is where you can make a lot of a particular protein, and you know what it is. So let's start on these, and I'll come to the cell-based and the phenotypic assays in a minute. So. Protein thermal shift works on this principle of if you have a purified protein, as you heat it up, eventually the protein will, initially it will be folded and it will have its hydrophobic loops hidden inside of the folded protein. As the protein is heated up, the protein starts rattling and eventually a loop, a hydrophobic loop will pop out of the protein and it can then be bound by a dye. And that dye will then change in fluorescence upon binding of the protein. And as you heat up higher and higher temperature, the protein becomes unfolded uh, completely. If you have a small molecule and you get a, a, a very characteristic curve as shown here, a melting curve. If you have a small molecule that binds to your protein of interest, let's say a cofactor, it will form bonds with the protein and those bonds will thermally stabilize that protein on average so that the curve is shifted a few degrees and sometimes more than a few degrees, in some cases, 10, 15, 20 degrees can be shifted, right? How, how far, it, how much temperature it takes them to actually start unfolding the protein. So that's a very cool technology because it's agnostic to mechanism. You can find agonists, antagonists, allosteric, orthosteric co compounds. Uh, it's gonna help you if you wanna do crystallography, it's gonna help you more than likely that those compounds that stabilize the protein are, are, are gonna help stabilize the structure. And uh, we've applied this technology now to uh, I, you know, 30, 40, 50 targets and have had great success in doing so. Um, once you have that in mind, you can then think of, all right, well, then I'm gonna have this as one of my primary assets. All right, so the top of your testing funnel is gonna be, I'm gonna screen 300,000 compounds in protein thermal shift. I'm gonna have a single concentration of compound and I'm gonna have a single, uh, you know, single amount of protein. Now, in this particular case, Protein thermal shift is a pretty greedy assay. It needs nearly a microgram of protein per well. So that's a lot of protein if you can't make lots of it, right? But if you can make lots of it, let's say you can, one of the good things is a mass action assay, which means that we're gonna screen compounds typically at 25 micromolar, and you're gonna be have one microgram of your protein, and you're gonna look for all of the protein thermal uh, um, characteristics to be shifted. Right? So small impurities of compounds in your well, which often happens in the library, right, are not going to affect this assay very much because it's a mass action assay. Does that make sense? So downstream of that, you're going to find, all right, well, this compound here, it moves the thermal stability of this, comp this protein. Does it do it with a second, a different protein? In this case, I'm going to put GAP-DH as my counter, counter protein. Right? And if it, if it doesn't do that, then I can move it into secondary assays where I can start saying, well, how well does it work? in dose response, how well does it work in a different assay? Does, it, does this protein bind, does this compound bind my protein by a different technology? Isothermal carolimetry, um, SPR, other techniques, right? And so then we'll, when we start doing that, then we start finding fewer and fewer compounds, and then we can start considering moving those on into secondary assays, which may be cell-based. Um, I put up here an article, which we published recently about an, a compound we found there was an activator of the NAPT protein. Uh, if you want more details, it's a state of, this is really quite a cool uh, paper altogether, the same compound series. 
uh, we're able to be inhibitors and activators. Uh, so you can go and enjoy that. That particular program only used a screen of 50,000 compounds to actually get us going to, to find those uh, activators. Um, so I want to talk to you about this project, uh, a PHGDH, which has been a pain uh, for many reasons. Um, it was, uh, there have been quite a number of people who have been very excited about this particular enzyme in cancer metabolism. It's very central to many cancers that upregulated the, bio, the, the serine biosynthetic, biosynthetic pathway. If you knock out or knock down PHGDH in those cancers, those cells will die. And I think it's not just Jorge Muscat and Luke Cantley and others have shown this. I think it's almost certainly the case. So that would set us all off on the track of, let's just find an inhibitor of PHGDH. How hard can this be? And we had a huge number of assays available to us, one of which was protein thermal shift, along with enzymatic assays. Uh, we also downstream have some beautiful uh, metabolic profiling with, with the, uh, 13C serine flux to be able to show that indeed in a cell is your compound able to inhibit the enzyme and directly from the pro metabolic profile, you would see what were the metabolites go, uh, that would be changing. This seemed a great project to us. And in fact, we were almost certain that it was going to be a great project for protein thermal shift because here's shows some, uh, some, some isotherms uh, and this is where we're just taking some of the uh, native ligands, in this case, NADH. And you can see here, NADH in the graph there is shifting across the, the whole curve quite noticeably. And you will see that actually in dose response, the bottom panel, in dose responses, I increase the concentration of NADH in the thermal shift assay. I'm getting, I'm going from a, 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 a delta TM of 48 degrees, almost up to 57 degrees. So I'm almost getting a 10 degree centigrade thermal shift. Okay, granted it's at very high concentrations, but nevertheless, you, can, you feel pretty confident that this assay is able to detect things that bind the active site. So we went on and did a screen, um, uh, this 300,000 compound screen, and let's just focus not so much on the screening data, but more on the panel on the side here. You can see here, you, you find different types of molecules. Uh, the first ones, uh, 434 and 096, you can see nicely in a dose dependent way, increase the delta TM in thermal shift, don't do anything to get the H. And actually on the far is the enzyme activity assay. You can see that they are functional in that assay too, right? And not too bad, you know, straight out of the gate, out of screening, you're finding things that I've got IC50, a five micromolar, and we've not even started chemistry right? Yeah. So fairly certain that 096 is a real compound from our perspective, right? 703 and 726, we might come back to later. They don't inhibit enzyme activity, but they clearly have got a nice thermal shift pattern. So that means they bind somewhere on the protein, uh, but they don't inhibit enzymatic activity. And so well, what do you want one of those for? Well, we'll come back to degraders later and protax and um, molecular glues, but that's why you want things like that. So advancing this project, we were able to go from this compound, 5.096, 5, 5, uh, and we could co-crystallize it because I just told you these two, once you can make lots of protein and you can, uh, you, and they thermally stabilize, it works well. And then using structure-based drug design uh, well, it used, uh, tech, you know, to, to, to inform on where to, to uh, expand the comp, you can see the compound sitting nicely in the active site here. And as you start making, you, you can see the picture change as we start filling the hole in, picking up, I'm starting to pick up activity. We went to 810 nanomolar, 360 nanomolar. Uh, and well, let's go back to the 360 nanomolar. Uh, it, it's getting to be a pretty potent inhibitor, but if you can see down in this little table here, pretty disappointing. It's pretty horrible in cells. It's like 14 micromolar in cells in terms of being able to affect proliferation. We're going, well, that's not good. Anyway, we keep on making compounds. We get more potent and more potent. And in fact, we start to get compounds at the end that are really pretty potent, right? Started to get to 30, 40 nanomolar. But whatever we do, we just do not seem to have very good cellular activity. So when you get to that state, you, um, the, the, the cell biologists say, well, it's the chemist's fault. They made compounds that don't go across the cell membrane. That's, that's the typical thing, right? So what are you gonna do about that? Well, it turns out there's a lot of competition in this program 
And so the, there are other, other, in, uh, other companies, uh, Abiotech, AstraZeneca, Boehringer Ingelheim, they were also started to publish that they had very important, in, impressive inhibitors and they couldn't get very good activity either. Uh, and they kept blaming it on permeability and this and that. So we started to look at using a different assay and this is using a cellular thermal shift version. So it's a thermal shift version inside a cell. And the way this assay works, it's super cool and really works very well. You tag your protein of interest, in this case, PHGDH, with a tiny little fragment of, uh, it's called Hybit. It's an 11 amino acid complementation tag that when it meets its, part, its, its other partner, which is large bit, it, it now makes a complete luciferase and that luciferase will then generate light. So the way this works is you tag your protein, make a stable cell line, or you can crisper the tag in if you prefer. We've done all of these things. Stay in, transfect cells, put the same cells in all the wells. Some of those wells in certain rows, you're gonna add compound and other rows, you're just gonna leave blank. Uh, and then you ramp up the temperature. Um, and uh, as you ramp up the temperature across the columns, you will then be able to see uh, a little later that when we plot this, this uh, whole 96 well plate, we're gonna see different temperatures when we then come back and add the large bit and say, well, was the protein stable at that temperature or was it denatured at that temperature? With drug, if you add drug, you can shift the temperature at which the protein inside the cell is denatured, right? And so by doing so, you can get on-target cell engagement assay, which is a gift. And in fact, this thing is really quantitative, surprisingly quantitative, and can, when done different ways around, you can either do it by changing drug concentration, holding a single, con single temperature, or in this case, having a single concentration of drug and changing the temperature. Either way around, you can get quantitation on this, and this shows you kind of how you get all sorts of different types of, uh, of profiles here. You see they're very believable. See the, the strong destabilizer down here. Um, in actual fact, the strong de destabilizer binds to the active site of PHGDH, displacing NADH, which gives, you remember from my first, gave a very strong thermal stability. The compound actually, when it binds, is provide, generates a less stable complex than the cofactor but I digress. Anyway, when we've gone through all this, we realize that in fact, the compounds get in the cell just fine. They get hit the target just fine at concentrations that matter. So what's wrong, right? That's where you're left with. Well, after a while, we started digging in further. And uh, the, the color, the color uh, that we, we noticed that when we added our compounds to cell, the amount of PHGDH protein started going up. And in fact, what well, with a lot of other work, we got, as soon as you start adding bona fide potent inhibitors of this enzyme to the cells, they sense it and then start increasing the levels of ATF4. Once you do that, you upregulate a whole cascade of proteins involved in cell survival. And they upregulate all of the components of the, bio, the serine biosynthetic pathway, PHGDH, PSAP, PSP. They increase the peak, like, peak glycoprotein pumps, pumping your, pumping your compound out increase of drug metabolism enzymes. I mean, the whole thing is just a disaster. And after about 12 hours, so in the first few hours, the compound's working great. You can see that by metabolic profiling. 24 hours later, they barely work at all. And so now if you remember, this target was validated by genetically knocking down the protein, not by inhibiting it, by knocking it out. So our conclusion from this was that we didn't want an active site inhibitor. We wanted a degrader. So if you degrade it, if you could degrade the protein, like happens, uh, you know, with uh, the imits, right? Then you're in, you, you would actually, this whole thing probably wouldn't happen. You'd actually be able to get rid of the protein itself and kill off the cells. So that's been our, that's where that program is right now. After all of that work, where we are, we've got small molecules that we probably can use and we are making protact molecules right now to actually result in the degradation. We're also using the high bit sensitivity assay to simply look for monovalent degraders. In other words, the high bit assay, which is highly quantitative to tell how much protein is actually present, uh, particularly in the crispr in tag, is present in the well. And then you add your compounds and see whether you can reduce 
in, in a one to two hour period, the level of protein. Um, and we're also been doing it as also with uh, high counter microscopy, it's imaging too. So that gives you a, a kind of end game of that. Just to, to finish off though about protein thermal shift, in my opinion, extremely valuable assay in the, in the portfolio. Um, really wants, you need about a microgram per well. You don't want any tags, no GST, no MBP, nice purified protein that gives a nice melting curve. That is almost uh, a great place to be, uh, to, be, to, be, to be going for. You will find from that compounds that bind, whether they're allosteric, orthosteric, agonist, antagonist, whatever, it's just a binding. And then you need a, a whole series of uh, activity assays or other assays downstream to convince yourself it's a bona fide hit. Very suitable for proteases, kinases, um, phosphatases, have great success with phosphatases with this assay. Um, and uh, seems to be um, really well suited to, the, to this, you know, the, this technology. Uh, so that's uh, where I'm gonna leave the first section. Let's moving on then to the next section, which is cell-based reporter assays. Now, this is probably the, the, the zone we have the biggest um, um, falling out with people on, right? People come to us and say, well, I've put a luciferase after this promoter, or I've, I've, I, this is the way, I know how you guys, how you do it. You have a 384 well plate and you put luciferase after this promoter or this or that. And I, we just do not like that approach at all. And I will come to why in a moment. What we wouldn't mind, if you want to measure the level of a protein, use something like a high bit tag. It's quantitative over four logs. It is not susceptible per se, to things like chaperone folding and, inhib and, and ways of inhibiting, because it's just a little tag and the, and the de detecting is added after the experiment. Or if you want to monitor things like promoter activity, we would hi highly push the, you just straight using a label-free approach and using four color qPCR in 1536 well. It's hard to do, but incredibly re reproducible and relevant with respect to minimally manipulated biology. Right? Because you have done nothing. You can take primary human cancer cells and you can do four color qPCR if you're looking for compounds to affect something going up or going down, a mini signature. Uh, this, is, this is a technology. So long as there's enough expression of those particular uh, transcripts and it's not all hovering around zero, great approach to go. But let's just talk up for a moment about uh, luciferase. So in our experience, and when I say that, we have probably done about 80 high throughput screens and using luciferase reporters. Um, we haven't got a single project that has advanced to being a lead out of the, all of those screens. Um, and the reason being is that what happens is the noise of the assay overwhelms the signal. So there are lots of compounds that can turn up or down uh, a particular a, a, a luciferase construct. The luciferase itself can go up or down for various different reasons. And um, it, it just doesn't, it's the whole assay format is just befuddled by that. So that doesn't mean that if you actually have a hit that works and actually is real and bona fide, and the luciferase assays can read it, that doesn't mean that assay isn't real, it is. It's just not a good technology to find hits in the first place. And if you want to know why, I would go and read this paper. It just came out, it's an absolute state of the art, piece of work done by NCATS, NIH group, in which they put a reporter one and reporter two. So those two, that's a, 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 a um, two a GFP, a GFP and a, and a, a, a blue and a, and a green reporter in coincidence. So ideally when you had something like this, both the reporters should go up at the same time if it's a real, if it's a real thing, and they should both go down at the same time. And why wouldn't it always do that? Because they should be faithful. And what they've gone on to show, and they did, this is a fantastic piece of work. They did a fit, nearly 50,000 compound screen in QHDS. That means they did quantitative HDS. So each of those data, each of these has got like five or six data points behind it. So they, and you can see here, uh, so um, in the first panel C, if you look in C, you've got a compound that's a real compound. In other words, the, F Luke and N Luke, the two coincident reports are both going down with a credible curve, and the white the white squares, sorry, the white the white circles, which is cell tighter glow, are straight. So you, this compound inhibited 
both of those two enzymes or reduced the expression of both those two enzymes the same and there was no cell death. Great, that's exactly what you'd expect. Why isn't everything else like that? Well, obviously some of them would be like D. Well, D is where that you, the reason you got that curve was because of, it was cytotoxic, right? Okay, fine. But what about E, F, G, and H? This is horrible. But you've got compounds that reduce the signal of F loop, but don't affect M loop. This is a coincidence reporter. I mean, this is like, wow. Or the other way around, or you've got things like in H, where it increases the F loop and decreases, um, uh, or, or increases one, it leaves the other one the same, and yet it's cytotoxic. It's just, so when you think you can counter screen out this noise, you can see how difficult it's going to be, right? Because these are all real, right? This is, this, they've gone to the effort to show you what you're up against, right? Now you could do a screen like this, it's incredibly expensive, right? But you could do a screen like this, right? In QHTS, with, two, with a coincidence reporter and indeed find the real hits. We would recommend a slightly different approach to this because that's kind of fairly, that's, uh, yeah, that's a lot of work. That's, um, you know, a million data points or more, uh, et cetera. Anyway, so we would uh, be against doing that. We would much prefer to be going for high bit tagging um, uh, of, your, of your reporter, uh, as a reporter, if you need to go that way. And I would encourage people to, to go and check out Hybit. It's made by Promega as a, as a technique, unbelievably sensitive over, let's say, four logs of sensitivity. Uh, so huge dynamic range, very simple, and very amenable to a 1536-well uh, format uh, to, to be achieved. Easy to crisp the tag in to the loci and check where it is. And in addition to that, you can also get uh, life cell bio, bioluminescence by, crisp, by transfecting in the, the large bit into the cells to see exactly where your construct actually is, your protein of interest is. So that's sort of uh, my, my, my pitch to you on, on cell-based reporters. Um, I would go with high bit tagging or four color qPCR as, as a way of monitoring quantitatively the levels of transcription or levels of a protein. So um, let me keep going here, I think. Um, so let me move on to the last, the last section here, which is phenotypic screening, um, and particularly microscopy-based phenotypic screening. Um, again, uh, antibody staining used to be very difficult because it involved wash depths, um, but new, new, new equipment uh, along with uh, two levels. One, the microscope we have now is uh, you know, five to 10 times faster than the microscope we had 10 years ago. Uh, or five years ago even. Antibody wash steps are enabled by fancy machines, the blue cat washers that allow you to be able to you know, carefully uh, wash cells with antibody staining, such that it's completely achievable now, right? Uh, and so there's no real reason if your protein is of reasonable abundance, why you wouldn't use an, and you have an antibody. If you can't get an anti, well, fair enough, put a tag in, right? Um, if you are interested in a protein moving from A to B, or in fact, the phenotype is all about the dynamics of things, then in fact, tagging is okay, right? Like even with uh, EGFP or things like that, because you're really in, it's that move, it's that change in location that you're assaying, not the quantitative elements of how much a signal in total there is, it's the, it's the change in where the signal is, right? So that that is in fact, all right. So let's. We say we have done many, many different uh, assay formats. I think uh, we're, up, we're up to about 40 high content microscopy screens. Uh, I would remind you that obviously the technology behind all this, if you are interested in doing functional genomic screens, of course, the technology behind this is all very much the same. How can you get your assay into a format that, that is representing biology and so faithfully physiologically relevant uh, and you're able to monitor and measure things? Um, we have a developed over the time a lot of software and process to help us do all this, right? And that allows us to be able to screen a 300,000 compound library uh, in about a month, right? But it is not cheap. I, I will tell you, it's still not cheap because it takes a month and it takes some effort, but we have this whole thing pretty wired. Let me show you a couple of examples and then we'll end. One, which is one of my favorite examples, actually is the translocation of a nuclear receptor from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. This turns out to be an unbelievably powerful screen. Uh, 
what I'm showing you is not what we did, but it's good. It's a good movie. It shows you the uh, on addition of cortisol to the cells, you can see the glucocorticoid receptor going from the cytoplasm, all right, where it is now into the nucleus. And it does that in about 45 minutes. Now we didn't use GFP tagging for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So we used antibody staining and we were looking for compounds uh, that would, would, would stop that process. And we wanted passive antagonists. So there are compounds out there today that are considered uh, in, inhibitors of this process, but they actually still bind the receptor, but they bind it in a way that, that prevents it from actually binding the DNA. So it still goes into the nucleus, but it doesn't bind the DNA the same way. Okay, so it's sort of, it, 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 it's not a true passive antagonist. So we screen the library. And the why this screen is so powerful is because you, the, comp, the, the signal, you can take all the pictures and then you can segment things and you can see the signal going from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, all right? So you're monitoring over a 45 minute period that change. And because of that, it turns out it's incredibly robust assay right out the gate. We are able to find compounds like this uh, compound on the top, 7717. It was 320 nanomolar on cells as an inhibitor of that process. You can see here compared to um, mifepristone and the Lilly compound 2707, uh, when those are, uh, are put on cells, they actually induce the translocation, as you can see here, uh, in the agonist mode, whereas 7717 does not. In antagonist mode, in other words, where you're trying to look at preventing that translocation in the presence of, of cortisol, then you can see that you uh, uh, 7717 will behave as a true uh, antagonist. Um, so one of the hallmarks of the screen uh, was that we screened 300,000 compounds and found two positives. That was all. We didn't find thousands and thousands of compounds we had to sort through. There were very, very few. And in fact, that is the hallmark of all really good phenotypic screens. The, the, the actual the hit rate is very low in our experience. Anyway, we were able to go on and use this compound and improve its activity using structure-based, uh, sorry, medicinal chemistry. And the reason we can do that is because you can see in here this is a, a, an overlay of graphs of the same assay done over uh, a 18 month period. And you can see how tightly those curves overlap each other, right? For a phenotypic assay, which means that you can use this assay to drive medicinal chemistry, right? So people are always asking when you don't know what the target is, how are you gonna drive chemistry? You can do that so long as the assay itself is really robust and reproducible. That allowed us to, ex to basically understand this structure activity relationship to be able to then design a biotinylated version of it and then to pull out the target and prove that the target itself actually was a component of the glucocorticoid receptor. And we now know that this compound is a really interesting compound. It binds to the complex and freezes it into a state that is incompetent to bind agonist. So, um, Downstream, as I say, so fight, this is obviously always the Achilles heel of, of phenotypic screens. How are you going to find the target? And as I just say, in this case, we were able to, in fact, not just this, uh, two or three other examples like this, get an assay, get it really well dialed in, such that it's really robust. And when you can do that, you can then drive the potency of the compound down, ideally sub 100 nanomolar on cells, understand the SAR, understand where to put, uh, some the, the tags, and then you can go fishing with proteomics methods. You can make protac molecules, looking to what, see what protein is degraded in protac, or you can again use thermal stability in cells where you put the compound on cells and then see, take it through a thermal uh, challenge and see which protein was thermally stabilized. All of these three approaches have been successful, but only if you have potent compounds. You cannot do these things in general, or much less success, if you're uh, going to have compounds that are uh, mid, uh, you know, 10 micromolar or something like that. If you aren't so fortunate to have such a well-defined screen, and it's truly a black box screen, then what we would say is whatever happens, do your first initial phenotypic screens with highly characterized compounds, right? So that if you do get a hit, you've got a chance of finding the target. My final example, I just want to give you here, particularly as I'm talking to mainly, I, I believe, cancer, uh, people interested in cancer, is this was a project by Robert Weschler Rea here is interested in medulloblastoma, particularly group three medulloblastoma, which is driven particularly by the upregulation or overexpression of MYC. And you can, in fact, 
upregulation, overexpression of the MYC protein in this group three uh, medulla blastoma is the biome, is I believe the clinically, the clinically accepted biomarker that that is the, uh, the group of the, the, the characterization of your cancer the over and above the transcriptomic analysis. What he wanted to do was say, all right, let's go for it. If that is really the drive, let's do the best possible phenotypic screen we can do, which is to take the, the, the tumor from the child, passage it through the brain of a mouse, take the cells from the brain of the mouse, put them into a dish, plate them out, and then 16 hours later, challenge them with compound and look for a compound, the results in the di disappearance of MYC protein four hours later. And you're going, wow, that's uh, sure. How, that's not going to be easy. Well, we kept plugging away at it. We had a well-orchestrated testing funnel. We knew what we wanted to do. Um, we managed to optimize this, this, the protocols, get them down into a 1536 well format using a couple of controls, which actually an Aurora A inhibitor, particularly CD532 as a positive control to dial all the things in. Um, again, very low hit rates, which is, again, it was a good sign to us. Uh, but use, that use of PDX was definitely logistically challenging, really, to try and get enough cells to do. And this whole screen was done over a 10-month period and surprisingly held together as a data set. As I say, you basically um, are, whoops, whoops, sorry. You're, you're basically taking the cells, putting them into uh, 1536 well plates, incubating for four hours, fixing staining, and then quantitating. And you can see up there the CD532 was our positive control language to, to dial this in. So we, we did this, and this was one of our first uh, hits here uh, at 11.7 uh, micromolar. And here it is, you can see on the PDX51 cells, um, reducing the concentration of uh, MYC protein, didn't affect RV levels, and wasn't cytotoxic. Um, and this is the, 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 the micrographs to kind of show that. Now, Again, this was another really robust assay, which we could use to drive SAR. And so not that long after we were able to come up with this protein, sorry, this compound um, that uh, now we're at uh, 200 micromolar uh, on cells. You can see here on the MYC protein doesn't affect RB again, maybe a touch of cytotoxicity creeping in, but not really much. And we actually want it to be cytotoxic, but this is monitored at four hours. So you wouldn't expect to see that much at that time. Now this has gone on. And we're at the, you know, we're still in the midst of this project right now. Uh, 7047 is starting to look mighty potent um, and uh, is definitely affecting and reducing the levels of MYC protein in, uh, uh, in four hours in multiple PDXs and in various other cancers, actually. It is now starting to show differential cytotoxicity, as you can see up there. And uh, we're excited about this. The compound actually even gets into the brain. And most recently, we were actually starting to see uh, reduction in MIG levels in the in the uh, in in the tumor cells in the brain, and so uh, that gives you an example how you go from you know your thinking, uh, very clean thinking, I would say, uh, really validated target, and if it's really really validated, we'll focus on the endpoint that's incredibly valid, and even if it's hard, still try and go for it. So last couple of slides here, phenotypic screening, um, always use the most relevant possible cells you can to model the biology. So for us, we're very obsessed with primary human cells, patient-derived cells, PDXs, best you possibly can, uh, even if it's difficult. Uh, track the natively expressed protein with an antibody uh, rather than tags, but if you have to tag, CRISPR something in, um, or try and figure some other way around it to, to really to, to not put, not, not transfect something in that's big and bulky and starting to become less and less relevant. Um, well, I like to think of going from black box screening to what I call smaller grayer box screening. So shut, bring the timeline down one to two hours, six hours, something like that. Really try and bring it down. Best screens are when you add something to make something happen in a short period of time where something goes from A to B. Um, and uh, also been, as I say, successful at finding degraders. And as I say, the hallmark, because for us has been low hit rates. It sounds odd, but... Uh, I think that's indicative of, of the fact that really real assays that have really robustly reading out real biology are likely to look like that. Um, so, you know, this finishes up where I sort of started with was the three sections, protein thermal shift, great 
technology need lots of protein enzymatic acids certainly great they've been very successful need to be careful of some of them are very prone to artifacts particularly many of the for example we've wasted we did like eight different screens on phosphatases all of them are lost because the assays we use which is so susceptible to our chemical artifacts cell-based reporters really in our experience steer away from luciferase egfp anything to actually monitor the pro protein levels or promoter activity levels much preferring CRISPR high bits into the genome, uh, four color qPCR, things like that. Uh, the microscopy assays go for the most the best and native cells uh, to take the native antigens. Uh, and, you know, as I say, other labeling with EGFP if things are moving from A to B is, is still fine from our perspective. Final side then, so sort of guiding principles um, is this finding the signal in the noise. This is not to be underestimated. Assays can be great, but if they attract a lot of signal due to the format they have from the chemical collection that is noise or artifacts, you're gonna have a great deal of difficulty getting through that. And you, on paper, it looks good, but I can just tell you in practice, getting rid of that noise and actually getting to the layer of hits that are real uh, is uh, a challenge. Um, Critical to almost everything we do is something after the primary screen that is really trying to validate your hit as being real, right? And that is that you don't think they don't just fall out of the screen there and then. Uh, phenotypic screens, as I've just mentioned, short time triggered by something. Uh, if you have to go for a long time frame, then be very specific about what you're measuring, a pattern, a something really, really. Don't, try to avoid things like cell death, survival, proliferation. I mean, it, these are horrible ideas, if I might say so, right? They make, it just, it, it's just so much noise and you're gonna have so much difficulty coming backwards from that to figure out what the target is, if you ever can. Um, and finally, you know, the, the less characterized the target. So in other words, the more pathway, cell-based, phenotypic. In my experience, the more characterized the, the the screening library should be. So if it's if it's really black box, then screen 20,000 bioactive compounds and see what you find and then work, work off that. Okay, well, that was enough. And hopefully you all got something out of that that gave you some flavors of what to do, not to do. But what I would most say is I should put the telephone number to talk to us, yes. right? Because that probably more than anything is I can't teach you 15, 20 years worth of assay development that the guys here have lived and breathed and, uh, you know, in, in 45, 50 minutes. But so there we go. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to some questions. Thank you, Michael. That was just beyond exceptional, the examples, all the rich information, your expertise, and really grateful for your last comment about everyone reaching out and talking with your team. I know our preliminary experience already has been really um, fruitful and, and information rich, and I just want to say thank you again um, for all that you've done for us and supporting our community here. So um, we're gonna take some questions and um, definitely turn your cameras on if you'd like to engage as close to real seminars we can get right now. Um, we'll, I have one question in the chat. We'll start with a chat question from Wei Min Wan. If you'd like to um, turn your camera on and your question is how do you stain the protein by antibody in live cells? Yeah, so unless it's on the cell surface, that's gonna be kind of difficult. Um, so, um, you know, I think under those circumstances, I, you know, if that's what, you, if, this, if the cell, if the protein you want to look at is inside the cell, I would recommend that you're going to have to tag it with a GFP, EGFP or something to follow it, what it's going to do. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. I, I'm curious uh, if I can ask a question. I don't know if I'm uh, able to be heard, but I'm curious in some of the things where changes of the cells, for example, circadian changes, are those compounds that it's very easy for you to work out or are those painful lessons to learn? And I'm also curious about cells that respond by changing their frequency or 
fa or phase locking of responses that might give uh, different results in bulk and when following individual cells. Yeah. Um, speaking to people who, who I know on uh, have got great expertise on elements of the circadian rhythm, we just ignore it entirely, right? <laughs> Uh, and that's to our own. <laughs> I do, I do too, but I've been bitten by doing right. that. So, so I think that's why I was asking. Right now, what I would say that in general, I think you know, and, and maybe you know, that whether it's cell cycle or various other, you know, this has been one of the challenges on things like epigenetic inhibitors, right? Where you takes you have to go through at least one cell cycle to to see something happening. Um, or more, right? They, they are more challenging for us to do, right? And But that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. Things like uh, many of the phenotypic screens that we do, we do look to see how uniform the activity is across all the cells. And you are correct. Well, you're, if you are, that's what you're getting at to some extent, that there's a variability inherent within um, many of those assays that we just kind of blow it off and say, well, there you go, right? You know, we look at 100 cells and average it all up and hope for the best, right? And um, probably are missing out on, on, on by, by not taking account of, of elements like that. I mean, I would be interested if you've got ideas of how, how to make everyone behave better and, uh, you know, start at coffee break or something. I don't know when you start, right, for cells, whenever they, whenever they going to be at their oh. best to perform. I'm always biased by higher content, higher temporal resolution assays, but I know that those take more time. And so that's why I was curious. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, with, with respect to uh, higher resolution, uh, I mean, we're doing many, most of those high content microscopy assays are done at 40x or 63x, right? It right. takes I'm not worried time. about spatial resolution, but temporal resolution okay. that might allow you to sample and see heterogeneities that could be exploited or harvested. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think um, once you start introducing more time points and more in a primary screen, it just everything gets so blown up, right, in terms of the numbers that you need to do. So things like what you're mentioning there, you know, time courses, uh, if you think that that's something that's really important to investigate, I think that's probably a, you know what you do pretty early on in your secondary assays, right? See if it's still real across across a time frame. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of uh, circadian effects, right? The vast majority of HTS formats are on unsynchronized cells, so every single cell is out of phase, and so you're averaging across and when indeed we do luciferase screens looking for a 24-hour rhythm, we have to find a way to synchronize the cells in each well. But one of the synchronizing events is when drugs are pipetted in and other things. And so that's what I was wondering about compounds and uh, variabilities that could uh, hide the ability to see a, a, what could be a winner. Or, or maybe I should just keep on ignoring it. Is that what you're encouraging me, Steve? In a 1536 well plate, I think most of the time you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Okay. Michael, do you see moving um, uh, PTS assays as much as possible to be cellular assays then, given some of these... No, examples. no, because I, I, they, they are tricky in, in, yeah. in our experience, right? Tricky as in it's not, pre, it's not predictable whether it will, how well it will work. So yeah, I funny. didn't really go into it. So uh, I, I, I started to hint at it with the PHGDH example, which is where despite the fact that the compounds we had identified were really good thermal stabilizers, when we put them on cells, they destabilized it. And we're like, well, really? You know, how could that be? And then you kind of realize that NADH is even more strongly binding and you're displacing it. And so you're therefore, you know, uh, destabilizing it as a complex, right? So what you're monitoring in a cell is a complex and, and it's very, it's, it's not inherently, I think it's fascinating technology, but, but it's not inherently obvious what is going to happen because 
you are no longer looking at that protein in isolation. You're looking at that protein in the complex and in the moment. So the other thing I didn't tell you was when we took the cells uh, for the PHGDH program, and we, we grew them in, in serum-free media or in the presence of um, serum, you, you shifted the curve again, right? And you yeah. go, well, obviously you did, right? Yeah. Because of the NADH levels change. Yeah. Right, so, okay, but you, so here we are, we're just, you know, wandering along, right? We don't understand all the ins and outs of the cellular thermal shift assay. But what I would say is that the high bit tagging, that those assays are now called bits are assays, right? It's just remarkable, right? It, you know, we used it, old sets of technology of doing it by Western block. Well, you're not going to get much throughput with that. But with a high bit assay, you can now generate curve after curve after curve. And we're every project we do now, we, we do that with because being able to tell how much, of, if you're fortunate that your compound does generate a signal in a cell, and just about every kinase it does, for example, is, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if people have been keeping up on this, but I mean, Promega did a fantastic job with all the CDK inhibitors, went on to show, you know, just a sort of tour de force demonstration that the profile of a kinase inhibitor as generated by urofins, as in its biochemical profile, and the real profile of the compound in a cell as monitored by SETA are completely different. So those urofin panels are kind of like, nah, that's it. That's, you know, it's, it's the essence of what it is, right? But yeah, and expensive. What, what really is it binding in the presence of cellular ATP and to what extent it's binding that particular kinase, whether that's the real drive, it would appear that the SETA assay is, massively more competent at identifying that which you're really binding and stabilizing and changing. And um, I think, uh, yeah, we're seeing similar sorts of things from Protac as well, I think, right? What you actually degrade really in a cell. So. But, I, but let me just, just going back to you, I think PTS is, remains a, uh, uh, the, the traditional protein thermal shift assay remains a very powerful screen because um, of, of its ease and cost, right? So, you know, the real cost of, a, of, of that assay is mainly the cost of the protein, right? To do run the screen, right? There's nothing else, there's Cipro orange and temperature. I mean, this is not, not an expensive assay, right? In, in that respect. And in addition to that, every, if you, we've now screened the same 100,000 compounds against 40 different proteins. So we now have essentially generated a temp, a, essentially a sort of a PTS thermo, whatever, thermo map of our complete library, right? And so we're now so much better, I would immediately I would pinpoint yeah. those compounds that, they, because it's the same assay format every time. It's just purified protein and, uh, you know, and compound, right? So the, the, there's, there's not much to, to change. So I think that's why it's very good at finding real hits. If that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. Any other questions? A reminder, we, this is recorded and so you'll have it to go back. So there's a lot of information that I hope people do go back and look at the different assays. And importantly, the message today about the relevance um, to physiology, which was critical. And these examples and the um, PHGDH one blew, blew my mind, Michael. <laughs> I had not seen that one. That was amazing. So um, any other questions? And if not, um, I thank Michael for being with us today and spending his time and energy and passion for what he does with all of us. Um, we'll have another seminar coming up um, in November, um, uh, in additional dates in December. We'll send out more announcements for everyone and market it to all of you. But as Michael mentioned, please don't hesitate to contact us with any questions uh, and directly to Michael and his team. Um, we can help you with that and um, mediate those, those interactions if you like or interact directly. This really is about getting these conversations started and understanding what one another has and what's the best path forward to move, to move your, your project and find new therapeutics eventually. So we really look forward to engaging with you all in the seminar series. Yeah, and, and please please do feel 
you know, that you can reach out. It's, we kind of enjoy it. I mean, it's a, I, I think understanding people's biology who have a passion to try and find, a, you know, generate a therapeutic from, from their research that they've spent many, many years doing, least we can do is try and help you figure out either what the, what the target in the pathway should be, how you might go about addressing it and have a chat about it, right? You're welcome to ignore us, right? But, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, there, there, there are some tools and technologies that are used in, in, under the banner of high throughput screening that are just valuable approaches just for general bio, doing general biology, frankly, right? Understanding biology as everything's down to an assay, whether it's an assay to find a compound or an assay to understand things. You you need tools and technologies. So, um, Michael, yeah. we do we did miss a question in the chat. If we can address it here, and we can also follow up with the with the person that submitted it. Um, does the sub 100 nanomolar IC50 threshold also apply to a target binding molecule for further development to degraders, or do you degrade first and then optimize? Um, uh, um, well, degraders, it depends whether you mean a monovalent degrader or molecular glue, or whether you're discussing a um, protac, right? Obviously, if it's, if it's a molecular glue monovalent degrader, you're going to be hoping, right, that it binds your target, right? But, you know, it might not. But if it's, if it's going to be classified as a true molecular glue, that, that would be what it does. It binds, you found it by screening, it binds your target that you're looking to degrade and puts it into a confirmation to make it be degraded, right? So um, if on the other hand, you're talk, we're talking about PROTAC, which is having, you know, the, the component that you're, you, you, the, 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 the linker with, with the, you know, you're gonna, it's the bit that's binding to your target that you're gonna add a pomalemonide or whatever to. Um, there are no absolute rules, I think, of how potent you should bind there, but, the, the, that's a fuzzy world. And I only say that because there are compounds that bind not that well to, the, to, to your target and seem to be supremely well degraded and others that seem to bind quite strongly and aren't degraded. So there's obviously a lot to do with the geometry in, to be a degrader, right? To, to be a protag degrader. It's, not, it's just not inherently that straightforward. Um, so I hope that answered. I'm not sure I fully answered it. And protags, we're, we are not the experts. There are some great labs in the world. We're learning. Um, we're just using all our tools to try and learn fast. Yeah, thank you. I, that's, that's the sense I'm getting to that I'm, I can't find the exact go no goes yet. So I was curious to hear your thoughts on that. I'd make some molecules and see what happens. If you're making protax, just make some. Just stop being intellectual. Just make a few and see what happens and use a high bit readout to, to monitor and it's really important if you do that, you get the level of expression of the high bit protein about right. Because if it's too much, you're going to, you know, your poor little protac is going to be chomping away, right, with a lot to do, right? So you want, you want to have it fairly sensitive, right? So you can do that by just, you know, having a stable line that's not expressing too much, right? But I would highly recommend using, a, you know, a high bit tagged protein for, for, for that if you're if you're trying to do that, if you can, right? As long as it will, it's amenable to it. It's just uh, such high throughput and such quantitation. Thank you. All right, very good. All right, thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you, everybody. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks again, Michael.